Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the second Joint Hall Green North and Spark Hill online ward forum meeting. Um, everybody's really welcome. Um, if you're online and listening, you can add questions onto the chat bar, which we can ask um, for people to answer. So this is just a notice to advise any residents or anybody listening or participating in the online meeting that it is being recorded for um, future for future and available to, to look at in the future. Um, our first item on the agenda is the COVID-19 update, but we are still waiting for Dr. Varney to join the meeting at the moment. So what I will do is I will bring in Councillor Robson for her councillor update first. Oh no, he has joined the meeting now. So we'll pass over to we'll go, we'll go to yeah. Justin and we'll save me for we'll later. Go to, that's a Justin Vatney. I left for the COVID update now. Hello, Justin. Hi, Councillor Brennan. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you perfect. Right. Lovely. Hi everyone. Apologies. As as you can imagine, life is pretty frantic at the moment uh, as um new things come through. So uh, what I thought I'd do is give you a bit of an overview of where we are uh, in terms of COVID at the moment. Uh, I'll touch base uh, in terms of the testing and also a little bit on the vaccine uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about where you are as a particular ward uh, at the moment uh, and then happy to take any questions that uh, come through uh, as well. So where we are at the moment in terms of the, the overall rate uh, for the city, uh, so the most recent uh, data is showing us at about 190 cases per 100,000 population. Um, and we've continued to come down. That compares to 240 cases per 100,000 uh, the, in the previous seven days. Um, I would say what we're seeing is that rate of decline is starting to slow. So we're still coming down, but nowhere near as fast as we were in the immediate couple of weeks coming out of national lockdown. So still coming down, but it's more of a flatter curve than it was before. And, and that's raising people's concern at, you know, nationally is that we've come out of national lockdown into tier three and the rate of decline seems to be slowing. Now, what we're looking at is the, the kind of pattern of spread at the moment. Uh, and what we're continuing to see is the majority of contacts identified by people who test positive are people they live with or people who they visited in a private house or a private home. Um, and that comes through pretty consistently for us. It has done through most of the, uh, the outbreak. Um, and there's a relatively small amount that attributed to workplaces or to education settings or other settings. But the vast majority, it's either people you live with or people who visited you at home or you've gone into their homes. And those three groups are, are the vast majority of contacts that are identified. When we look at the profile of cases and, and the highest case rate in the city, it remains the 30 to 44 year old age group. So this is the group that for the last probably 12 weeks actually, have had the highest case rate in the city. And just to put that in perspective, the case rate uh, at the moment for that group is about 255 cases per 100,000. And that compares to 184 in 16 to 29 year olds and 124 in 0 to 15 year olds. So you can see it's quite a big difference. And, and you know that age group, followed by the 45 to 64, which is running at 221, those two are the highest two age groups when it comes to uh, case rates. Um, when we look at ethnicity, um, that we have based on the proportion of tests that are positive. Um, the largest proportion of new tests that are positive is our white community, followed by our Pakistani community, uh, and then our black and other Asian communities. Um, and we've seen that again uh, over the, the last four to six weeks uh, as well. Um, looking across the city, um, we now have about 23 areas that have shown a statistically significant decrease uh, between the last two weeks worth of rates uh, and we have two areas that have had an increase 
uh, in case rates uh, during that period. And in general, where we've seen areas that have had an increase, that's usually connected to a um, an outbreak in a care home or in a uh, or in a school potentially as well. So it's but it tends to be care homes that really uh, skew the numbers on this. Now, Councillor Brennan, can you just remind me which ward you come under in the um, the breakup of these things? You know, the ones we send you through on Mondays. Do you remember whether what Hall Green? Because it's Hall Green North, isn't it? That you're Hall in. Hall Green North and Spark Hill. Right. So that's why, because you're on two separate lines. Okay. Aren't you? Yeah. So Spark Hill um, case rate in Spark Hill is currently running at 194 cases per hundred thousand. Um, that's down on the previous week um, and in, in kind of real terms that's 42 cases in the last seven days um, but and you had 54 the week before so statistically that's not uh, that's no change so the, the statisticians would say you haven't really changed much it needs to be a bigger drop uh, than that to um, to be considered statistical but it does it's early signs moving in the right direction Hall Green North is a similar kind of pattern. Uh, case rate at the moment lower though, it's running at 145 cases per 100,000. And that's 33 cases uh, in the last week compared to 50 the week before. And um, we do we talk about it as case rate because obviously large awards, uh, if they've got large number of cases, but just eyeballing it for you, the largest number of cases we had in any ward in the city in the last seven days was 83 cases. So the challenge we have when we look at this across the city is that we're not talking about one ward generating hundreds and hundreds of cases. We did have that picture back in, in uh, August when it was very uh, defined areas where we we're seeing large number of cases. But now what we're seeing is across the city in most wards, it's between 30 and 50 cases. Um, and we've got a couple that are between 60 and 80 um, and everyone's starting to come down, but it's by small numbers everywhere. And what we really need is those to be bigger numbers everywhere to, to get us out of this. The other thing that they're looking at is the, um, the hospitalisation data. So what's the pressure on the NHS? And COVID is no less dangerous than it was back in the summer. Still just as infectious. Um, what's changed is we got better at treating it. So if you do get very sick with COVID and you go into hospital, um, you're much less likely to die. And that's really good news. The flip side of that is you're likely to stay in hospital longer. So back in the summer, if you got very sick with COVID, unfortunately, you go into hospital and you die a couple of days later. Now you're coming into hospital and you're surviving, but you're staying in a hospital bed for a week or two weeks. And therefore the hospital's getting kind of jammed up with COVID patients. And we're in that period of the year when it gets cold and dark, we trip, we slip, we break bones, um, our mental health is worse. And many health conditions get worse in the cold, dark weather as well. So that normally in a normal year, we would expect to see more cases going into hospital at the end of December, beginning of January. It's like the winter pressures, it's that crunch time. So our hospitals are looking at that going, all the beds we would normally have empty, all of our surge capacity is full of COVID patients. So we've kind of got nowhere to go as we get more demand over the rest of December and, and into January. So they're very nervous at the moment about what will happen uh, there. And obviously there will be an impact to the Christmas bubbles uh, in terms of they are likely to increase uh, the rate of cases. So that is an area of concern and we probably will see a bit of an uptick in January because of that. So I think we, we'll see what the national decision is about uh, the tiers next week. Um, but I, I think, it, you know, we probably do need to stay in restrictions for a bit longer to give our NHS a fighting chance for, for Jan January um, because we've just not come down far enough yet. We really would want to be well under 150 cases per 100,000 and be down there for at least a week um, for us to be confident that, that things were in a good place. And we just haven't quite made it yet. Um, but I think it is in sight for the end of December. And you know, I think there's everything to play for from that perspective. So moving quickly on to testing, three types of tests. Um, antibody test, it's a blood test. 
Um, you can only get it privately at the moment. Basically, the antibody test is saying, do you have antibodies to COVID? Now, we know that a lot of people who caught COVID um, didn't develop antibodies. Those that did, their bodies often forget how to make them um, because when we learn to defend ourselves naturally to an infection, we tend not to be as good at as when we get given a vaccine. So, you know, frankly, if you're interested, go and spend the money, but I don't think it makes any difference. Even if you have antibodies, doesn't change your social distancing, doesn't change your face covering, doesn't make any difference from that point of view. Second type of test is a PCR test, swab to the back of your nose, back of your throat, get sent off to the lab. Fancy machine in the lab um, basically looks for very, very small amounts of the virus. And so it's very good at saying, have you got COVID, even if you're the very early stages of infection. So we use the PCR test for people who are symptomatic to say, is this COVID or not? Definitely, because it's very accurate at that. So we can get the right advice in place to stop the virus spreading. The new type of test, the third type, lateral flow test, same swab, back of your nose, back of your throat. But this time you give it to a technician, mixes it with some liquid, drops it onto a little testing kit, which um, looks a bit like a pregnancy test. It's a little plastic strip with some special paper inside. That test is very good at saying, are you infectious now? And the reason it's good at doing that is it can only really detect the virus when there's a lot of it on that swab from your nose or your throat. And you're most likely to be infectious when you've got a lot of virus in your nose or your throat. And that makes sense because you're coughing it and blowing it out everywhere. So the lateral flow is only really good at finding it when there's lots of it there. And that's why we use it to test people that haven't got symptoms, but might be infectious. And that's because we've discovered more about the number of people who don't have symptoms or have very mild symptoms, but can still be infectious. So that's the new test. And you'll see we'll be starting to roll out testing sites for that over the next couple of weeks um, as, as we move forward to allow people to take that test, particularly if they're working in close contact businesses uh, or industries. So they're likely to be in closed spaces with people uh, where we can, uh, where there's an increased risk of transmission and spread. So that's where we are on testing. A little bit on vaccination. So first of all, uh, vaccination is led by the NHS. Um, so the council's role is really just to support the NHS in this. We don't have any influence on who gets the vaccine when. That is all done as a national decision. Um, and the first vaccine's been approved. That's the Pfizer vaccine. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is kind of the most fragile of the vaccines and has to be kept very cold. So every time you move it, it defrosts a little bit. Uh, you know, and we all know what happens if you take ice cream in and out of the freezer, you very soon end up with that nasty crystal taste in your ice cream. Well, the vaccine's no different. If you keep defrosting it and refrosting it, it basically crystallizes and stops working. So there's a limit to how much it can be moved and therefore there are designated sites that are identified where it's going to be delivered from. Um, the Joint Committee for Vaccine and Immunisation, JCVI, have decided who gets it first and that will be the over 80s, people who work in elderly care homes and frontline NHS staff. And then they'll be rolled out uh, to other age groups as more vaccine becomes available. The AstraZeneca vaccine is going through its final stages. That's a bit of a stronger vaccine, so that can be put in a normal fridge. That'll make life a lot easier to get that vaccine into uh, to people who are housebound, for example, and can't get to a vaccination site. And we hope that that will get approved in early January. And then there's also a vaccine called Moderna, which is kind of in between the two when it comes to its resilience. And we're hoping also that will get signed off in January. Now, all of those vaccines, two injections a month apart. So even with everything going to plan, I think it is unlikely we will get, it's unlikely everyone who needs the vaccine, who is most vulnerable, will have got it before at least the end of April. Um, so we're really looking at, at it's going to take until the late spring for the most vulnerable to be vaccinated. And then there's quite a lot of other people that need to be vaccinated to protect them before we can start to see restrictions lifted and more relaxation. So I think you know, we, we've still got a way to go. We've done amazingly, Birmingham, in terms of managing this outbreak and keeping things under control. If you looked at it on paper when we started, 
Birmingham would have been the basket case of COVID for the country. And we haven't. We've weathered, it, weathered this incredibly well. And that's down to the work that you're all doing in your lives, keeping each other safe, because you're most likely to catch COVID from someone you know and care about. Because those are the people we let down our guards with. We go in for a hug. And it's really important as we approach Christmas, and we might form that Christmas bubble between three households, um, your household and two other households, once you're locked in, you're locked in for the whole of Christmas. You can't go visit anyone else. It's just those three households together. So choose carefully, but also think about the people that you're going to be with. You still have to be doing the hand washing. You need to keep spaces ventilated. Please wash your hands before you're passing Christmas crackers. Think about how you can keep as much distance as possible because you want to protect the people you care about so they see Christmas next year and the year after. So it might be about making some difficult decisions this year to make sure that you see people next year and in years to come. But I do hope that that's helped give you a bit of a sense of where we're at and happy to take any questions. I've got three questions. Um, so the first question I've got through is, will the COVID injection become compulsory? As far as I know, there are no plans for the vaccine to be compulsory. Um, the one caveat I would say is that there are some vaccines that as a healthcare professional, back when I used to work in hospital, I had to have. So for example, my BCG or MMR for measles, mumps and rubella. So it may be that the NHS makes a decision that NHS staff would have to have it um, to protect their patients. Um, but I think that's crystal ball gazing. There's no plans at the moment for it to make uh, the public mandatory. Um, there may also be that certain industries start to say, well, actually, you need the vaccine to get certain freedoms. So, you know, we might see a world where some countries say, well, you can only fly to us if you've had the vaccine. But I don't think any of that's likely to happen until well in the autumn when the vaccine is freely available, because if they did it any sooner, it just wouldn't be fair. Right, it's to go live on me. So the next question kind of flows into that. It says, so if I don't get the COVID vaccination done, what things will I be banned from? For example, not being able to leave the UK or attend certain places. Yeah, so at the moment, um, I would say we, we, at the moment I'd say we don't know. Um, as I said before, I think some countries may make that decision. Wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me particularly once vaccine becomes more freely available. And, and many of you know, you know, if you go to some countries, you have to have yellow fever or typhoid vaccination. So travel vaccines, nothing particularly new. Um, it's just, I think it'd be hard for a country to do it until uh, the vaccine is rolled out. Um, you know, I think we'll, we'll see what happens when it comes to things like care home visiting. You know, actually when an entire care home has been vaccinated, does that mean it's safer for you to go and hug your granny? Um, I think it probably would, but I, you know, that's crystal ball gazing as well. We'll see. Um, but you know, what we're aiming for is the vast majority of people who are most likely to die or end up in hospital with COVID to have had two doses of the vaccine. And once that's happened, then it's likely that the rest of us can get a bit more relaxation. But ideally, we want to get to the vast majority of the population vaccinated so we can basically stamp out COVID. Next, the next question is, how accurate is the lateral flow test taking into account Sheffield City Council have suspended the use of this test? Yeah, so it's important to, to explain, you know, what lateral flow is good at is finding the virus when there's a lot of it about. Now, we've still got in Birmingham quite a high prevalence of, of the virus. There's quite a lot of the virus still going about. And at levels like where we are, um, the, the test is pretty accurate. Um, and it's pretty, the, the concern that areas like Sheffield have raised is that the test is very good at finding positives. So it's very rare for it to say you're positive, you're infectious, and then it turns out that you're not infectious. Um, where it makes mistakes is it occasionally misses people who are infectious and the test says, no, you're not. 
And the, the things that make that more likely is if the person using the kit, so when they take the swab from you and drop it and do it in the little bit of, of the machine, if they've not been trained properly, that's where the error happens. So you, that's where you start to see an increased number of false negatives. Now, it's important to remember lateral flow is not the great silver bullet. If you have a ne negative lateral flow test, it does not mean you can rush into a care home and hug your granny tomorrow. You still have to keep the social distance. You still have to wash your hands. You still have to wear a face covering. What it does is it says, you know, we can be a little bit more relaxed and we can probably take away the Perspex screen, but we can't stop doing all the other risk things we need to be doing. So lateral flow, think about it, is it's an additional protection. It's an, you know, even if lateral flow only picked up 50% of people who didn't have symptoms and were infectious, that's 50% of people we wouldn't have found any other way. So if you think about it that way, then you get less kind of stressed about whether it's telling people they're negative when they're not, because if they hadn't had the test, they wouldn't have known anyway. The important bit is what you do. And, and you, the, the important bit is if you get a negative test, it does not mean you forget all your COVID safety because that's not what lateral flow is saying you can do. Lateral flow is predominantly trying to find people who are infectious so that we get the right information to protect them and the people they care about. Um, what we're doing in the city is really focusing on a quality assurance process on how we make sure people using the kits are trained properly so that we can try and reduce that false negative number to as low as possible. And what we're seeing from the universities who've been using the lateral flow is a very, very low number of false positives, much, much lower than, than Liverpool. Um, and that really reflect actually they had a very tight training program um, and very good at instructing people how to do the swabs, keeping an eye on what's happening. So we're building on their learning to make sure as we use it in the city, we use it to the best possible way we can. OK, I'm going to put the next two questions together and they are, can you get COVID more than once? And if you've already had COVID or it's been in your household, why do you still need a vaccination? Great. So, yes, um, simple thing. Yes, you can get COVID more than once. And unfortunately, we've now got cases across the UK which show that people definitely had COVID uh, four or five months ago and they've caught it again. And this is because the research is showing that um, about a third of people don't develop any defence when they catch COVID. Um, and of those people that do, about a third of those, um, we they stop um, making the antibodies. And then also about a third of them don't make them in a way that works properly. So you can't be confident that if you've caught it, you're protected. And you certainly can't be confident if you live with someone who had it, that you definitely caught it. Um, because actually what we're seeing is in many households, where people have been really good at managing the environment and not spreading the germs. And the person who's got the infection has stayed in their room and been really good about that as well, that actually not everyone in the house catches it. So, um, you know, you can't, you can't uh, bank on the fact you've had it or you live with someone who's had it to keep you safe. You've got to keep doing the social distancing. And on the vaccine point, um, because of that, and also this was part of what they did in the trials we know that if you have had the vac if you have had the virus and you do have antibodies um your body basically treats the vaccine uh, like a booster so it's a bit like saying you know i learned french at school um, and now i'm going to france i'm going to do an extra little top-up class um there's no harm in that uh, and your body doesn't have an adverse reaction it just gets better and stronger defenses that, than it would have had otherwise So the next question is from Councillor Lou Robson and it says, will you be getting updates from the NHS on how quickly vulnerable people in the city are being vaccinated? Well, um, I'd like to say yes, but I don't know yet is the honest answer. Um, you know, um, I have regular meetings uh, with the leader and with Dave uh, Rosser, who's the Chief Exec of University Hospital Birmingham, and he's leading the vaccine rollout for the city. Um, and, um, you know, pretty much t tells us as soon as he knows, but, um, you know, it does change daily. 
Um, and at the moment, there are relatively small amounts of vaccine in the country. It's coming, but it, it is taking its time. So I'm expecting there will be a kind of net NHS dashboard that gives us this data, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, and when they when it does happen, I'm pretty confident because of our close relationship with the NHS, they will tell us what's going on. At least I hope they will. So another question on the vaccine and it says, what are the side effects of this vaccine? Would it affect as I get palpitations? So um, I think if you look up on the government website uh, on the uh, and uh, if you put in Pfizer vaccine and MHRA, um, that's the Medicines Healthcare Regulation Agency. Um, they did the kind of regulation and in that it lists all the side effects. It also lists who shouldn't have the vaccine. So this vaccine um, we're not giving to pregnant women. Um, and because of the adverse reaction that um, two people had who had severe anaphylaxis reactions already, it's not being given to people who have severe anaphylaxis. So very severe allergic reactions to other vaccines. Um, but for the vast majority of other patients, there are, as far as I know, there are no exclusions. Um, and so palpitations wouldn't be a health condition that should stop you having this vaccine if you're offered it. And the last question at the moment we've got is it, it says, do you think it is essential to wear a face covering in a factory environment where it is possible to maintain two metre separation? I think, I mean, I ultimately I would say, yes, I think it is advisable because it helps reduce your risk. Um, and I think it's question is whether you're moving around or not. That's one of the things in workplace. So if you're in a fixed place and you're two metres apart from everyone, then I think, uh, and, and the room is well ventilated, I should say that as well, then um, it's probably okay not to have your face covering on while you're in that space. The moment you start to move around, that's where you need the face covering on. And if the room isn't well ventilated, again, that would be another reason for a face covering. And we've certainly seen outbreaks in factories throughout the outbreak going on where the business has been quite good at the two metres distancing, but because it's a, a sealed environment, um, the air isn't circulating um, and that's increasing the spread and the transmission. So it's not just about the distance, it's also about whether people are moving about and how well ventilated the space is as well. Um, and there have been some quite big, and also actually the other thing I should say is noise. Noise is a really interesting uh, risk factor and one we've seen in factories particularly, if it's noisy, people shout. And shouting means you need to be more than two metres apart. And that's because you can't hear yourself over the machinery. So it's understandable where people shout, but that's one of the other reasons in a factory actually wearing a face covering is more helpful because people tend to have to shout because of the noise of the machines. And when you're shouting, all those little droplets that come out of your mouth because we're shouting can go that little bit further. And so two meters might not be enough. So, so one last question from me before we move on to our last, next topic. What would your advice be? And I know you've touched on it earlier, but just to reiterate, what would your advice be for people over the Christmas period? Well, first of all, try and have fun. Um, connect with the people you love and care about and whether that's ringing them up, writing a letter um, or uh, Zooming, teaming them, doing it online or if you are meeting them outdoors for a walk um, or you're meeting them indoors as part of your Christmas bubble, you know, use the time that we have off over the Christmas period to connect because it's been a really tough year um, and we've got to do a bit about our mental health and well-being as we go into this. Um, also think about how can you meet people that might be more vulnerable and not put them at risk. So you know, many people go out for that walk on Boxing Day. Um, You've still got to stick to the rule of six. Even if you're in bubbles, the rule of six applies outside. Um, but think about actually, do you do more walking over this Christmas period and go out and meet friends and people that you care about outside where the risk of transmission is a lot less? Um, where you're inside with people that you don't normally live with or people who are more vulnerable. Think about, can you stagger meal times? 
Can you avoid everyone sitting around the table at the same time? Be same watching telly, you know, stagger it. Everyone crushed up on the sofa in the front room with the windows closed and the fire on is the perfect breeding ground for COVID. So the more you can space people out, the more you can get air into the room, even if that's just making sure that the windows get opened in between granny and granddad watching uh, the Queen uh, and then everyone else piling in for the Disney movie afterwards. You know, using those kind of things will help. And then it is hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Wash your hands before you eat, wash your hands before you give presents. You know, keeping those simple things of hands, face and space do reduce the risk of transmission. And if you are going to form a bubble with someone who's vulnerable this Christmas, I would strongly advise if you are able to isolate from now until the 23rd, if you can work from home and stay at home for the next what will be 13 days now, that reduces the risk of you being exposed to COVID and that reduces the risk of you taking it to them. So if you are going to bubble with someone who's vulnerable, that's one of the things you can do that will reduce the risk. But try and enjoy the period. Um, try and get a bit of a reboot. We've still got a way to go, um, but I hope you'll have a happy Christmas, however you celebrate it. Thank you, Justin, and thank you so much for coming to speak to us this evening. We hope you have a lovely Christmas and a happy new year as well. I'm now going to move us on to our fourth agenda item, um, which is emergency transport plan response and low traffic neighbourhoods. I'm very happy to say that we've got the lovely Joe Green here, the travel demand manager, to speak to us. So I'm going to hand over to him now. Uh, thank you, Councillor Brennan, and good evening, everyone. Um, nice to be with you all this evening. Uh, I'm just going to provide a short presentation on um, the emergency Birmingham transport plan uh, and um, progress to date, uh, and also a little bit about the Places for People programme within that. And then very happy to take some questions at the end if there's anything people would like to know more about. Um, so the, the emergency Birmingham Transport Plan was published uh, back in May. Um, it built on the draft Birmingham Transport Plan that we consulted on at the start of the year, which seems like a very long time ago now. Um, and it was based on the same vision and big moves within that document, uh, but adapting it to the sort of changing circumstances we found ourselves in as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and it was looking at what we needed to do to ensure that there was safe space for people to get around uh, on foot, by bike, uh, but also to social distance. Uh, and the other thing that the emergency transport plan did uh, is it positioned us really well to respond to the um, emergency active travel fund that the Department for Transport announced uh, earlier this year and, and funding that they were making available to local authorities through that. As I say, it was based on the same vision and big moves as the draft Birmingham transport plan, uh, but, but repositioning it slightly to the changing circumstances and, and the bits that are in bold on here uh, are the bits that were new. Um, but as with the draft transport plan, the emergency transport plan looks at what is it that Birmingham needs to do to ensure that we provide safe, healthy environments uh, where people can get around the city, where they need to go uh, on foot, by bike, using public transport. Um, and also, as I say, this, this new concept of, of social distancing that came in uh, this year. Both of the transport plans are structured around four big moves or, or objectives. Um, which I'll go through very quickly. Firstly, partly looking at where we need to reallocate road space uh, away from a uh, private car to create uh, additional safe space for, for walking, cycling and public transport. Um, a big move around transforming the city centre, uh, ensuring that the centre of Birmingham uh, has high quality public realm environments uh, for people to get around uh, and also maintaining uh, services on public transport with reduced capacity. Prioritising active travel or walking and cycling in local neighbourhoods uh, and that's where the Places for People programme comes in and, and I will say a bit more about that uh, later on. And finally, potentially managing demand through parking measures where we might repurpose some of the land and space that's often taken up in communities and local centres with things like on-street parking um, to create some of that additional space required. 
Uh, and, and as I mentioned, we're in the fortunate position of having some additional funding made available to the City Council for this. Um, the, the Emergency Active Travel Fund or EATF uh, is part of a two billion package to create a new era for walking and cycling uh, across uh, the UK. Um, 250 million of that has been released this year. Um, in terms of the Emergency Active Travel Fund, uh, that was for councils to deliver temporary interventions uh, to uh, create an environment safer for walking and cycling and that local authorities, the message from the Department of Transport was very clear. Councils did have to show that we had um, meaningful plans to deliver these sorts of schemes very quickly um, and, and deliver that uh, within a, a few weeks. The EATF has been made available in two tranches of funding. Uh, the first tranche, which I'll share some deal details on now, was made available in July. And then the second tranche of funding is, has just been released in the last few weeks. Uh, and, and we're just finalising everything that's going to come forward through that. Uh, in Birmingham, the uh, Emergency Active Travel Fund programme that we've put together includes four types or categories of schemes. Uh, firstly, a series of pop-up cycle lanes that have been delivered across the city on some of the main roads, main corridors into the city centre and also linking some other key destinations uh, such as some of our main hospitals. Um, also a number of local centre schemes uh, where we've widened pavements, created additional space for social distancing when, when people are queuing or moving around those areas. Um, the city centre segments initiative or, or traffic cells, which is something that was um, one of the four big moves in the transport plan, uh, looking at how we encourage people to get around the city centre on foot, on bike and, and use public transport by restricting through traffic to some extent while still ensuring everyone that needs to access places by private vehicle is able to do so. Um, and then finally, places for people uh, piloting low traffic neighbourhoods in parts of the city to support walking and cycling for local trips to school, to the shops, getting around the local area. All of these schemes have been delivered as temporary measures on a trial basis, generally for around six months initially, uh, and using experimental traffic regulation orders. And the benefit of that approach means that the schemes can be changed or removed or made more permanent at a later stage, uh, depending on how things go and, and the feedback that we receive. Um, and just to um, sort of show you where some of these measures have been delivered, this is a map of the uh, schemes that we've delivered uh, as part of the first tranche of funding. Um, this, this presentation can be shared uh, after the meeting if people can't see this very clearly on screens at the moment uh, or want to be able to study it uh, in more detail. It is also uh, online on the City Council's website. All of these schemes were completed um, a few weeks ago now, so by, by sort of October time, everything was in place. Uh, as I say, they're being delivered as um, temporary schemes and we're already starting to review how they're going and, and what needs to happen next. Um, so last month we've, we've launched a, a full post implementation review of all of these schemes um, to look at how well they're working, uh, decide whether anything needs to be changed, moved or, or removed, or look at what we might make more permanent through the next bit of funding. Uh, and that is looking at um, traffic assessments, road safety audits, uh, equality impact assessments uh, and all sorts of monitoring data, traffic counts, etc. Alongside more sort of quality feedback. So the things that people who live in these areas are telling us what they think, how they're finding it, what they like, what they don't like, comments that they've got. Um, and some of that's um, come online through uh, emails that we receive. Also, we've got a digital engagement platform, Commonplace, um, that's had a, a lot of engagement and a lot of comments on some of these schemes uh, alongside the Birmingham Be Heard portal, which we use for the uh, more formal consultations. So currently we're, we're carrying out the um, post implementation review of the first set of schemes, whilst also thinking about what comes next and the second tranche of funding. 
the the second tranche of funding uh, was announced last month. I put finally on there because originally I think we put this submission in in August and were told that we'd know in early September. So we have been waiting quite a while for the, the DFT to confirm exactly what we're receiving. But the good news is, is that we are getting um, all of the, the funding that we've asked for. Uh, it comes through West Midlands Combined Authority and Transport for West Midlands through receiving a total of £13 million uh, and over £4 million of that is coming to Birmingham City Council for our next phase of schemes. Uh, something that the Department for Transport have stressed is um, that there needs to be a more and stronger consultation on what happens next. I think with the first set of schemes, because of the timescales we were working to, uh, a lot of it did happen very quickly and we were limited in the extent that we could let people know what was happening and get their feedback, although we did try to do that as much as possible where we could. Um, but for these new schemes, there will be uh, all sorts of surveys with local residents uh, and, and various other ways to get involved in what's happening. This next tranche of funding needs to be committed, so allocated to particular schemes or projects by next March, by the end of this financial year, but we have got a bit more time uh, to actually deliver the schemes. Uh, so by next uh, March, uh, all of that will need to be in place. Uh, and as I mentioned, some of that will be looking at where we make some of the, the, the temporary schemes more permanent, but there's also funding for some additional walking and cycling schemes, uh, as well as some more places for people, which I will come on to now. So the um, Places for People programme uh, was launched on, on the back of the emergency transport plan in June um, and it's a, a key part of how we want to deliver the big move around encouraging walking and cycling in local neighbourhoods, in local areas. It's around all of the things we can do to reclaim local streets for, for walking and cycling, um, but also for, for playing out, for socialising, and one of the best comparisons I can give is if people think back to when we had the original lockdown period in, in March and April this year, um, a lot of people commented on, on how nice it was to have less traffic on their streets, um, be able to get out on foot, on bike with the family, um, noticing nature and, and, and hearing birdsong more. Um, and, and really that's the sort of thing we're seeking to achieve here in many parts of Birmingham where there is cleaner air, a quieter environment and safer streets. And, and the, the main thing that's needed to uh, deliver that is to, to reduce the volume of traffic on, on local streets. Something that is a, a large part of this is, is a term which uh, might be a, a new one for some people of, of low traffic neighbourhoods. These are groups of residential streets where measures are put in place to, to discourage or restrict through trips by motor vehicles um, so that people aren't able to use residential streets as sort of cut throughs. People who live in the area can still drive onto their street, have to, um, visitors, have deliveries, etc. Uh, although sometimes the, the access route changes, um, but what it takes out is the ability for people to cut through these areas. Um, Obviously not all streets uh, can be or, or are suitable for uh, restricting in that way uh, and on um, more main roads which people live on as well there's also a need to look at how we reduce traffic on those, how we address speeding, where we might provide safer crossings um, but ultimately what we're looking to achieve with low traffic neighbourhoods uh, is, is reducing the amount of traffic so that it's nicer for people to be outside, um, to walk, cycle or, or just spend time. And these are just a few photos of some of the schemes that we've delivered through the first sort of phase of Places for People. Uh, we've had two pilots in Kings Heath and Lazelles, uh, as well as delivering some sort of early demonstration measures in Moseley, in Bourneville and in Castlevale. But this is something that we want really to extend across the whole of Birmingham and we're just working out ways of, of doing that. Um, what you can see in some of these photos is where planters and bollards have been used to close roads to through traffic. Uh, technical term is modal filter. Uh, but what that means is that people can't drive through these areas, but you could still get on through there, as you can see, on bike, on scooters, on skateboards, on mobility scooters. Um, so it means that these, these streets do become uh, much quieter and see a lot less volume of traffic. What we've also done is work very closely with groups such as the Active Wellbeing Society 
and um, Sustrans to involve local residents in, in what happens with these spaces. So in a number of the planters, uh, local residents have got involved in, in planting those, in decorating them, in putting some sort of signs up and chalk drawings in places, because uh, really what this is about is about creating community spaces uh, on, on these uh, streets and areas too. So in terms of sort of future places for people schemes, what we'd like to do is deliver a lot, a lot of similar schemes uh, across the city, uh, in, including in, in Spark Hill, in Hall Green, um, and uh, that may well be delivering things like the road closures or traffic restrictions, um, but it might also be looking at what else we can do alongside that to address whatever the particular issues are, whether that's around speeding, dangerous driving, um, parking infringements, etc. Uh, so as well as some of the traffic restrictions and parking restrictions, we will look at various traffic calming measures, um, putting in safer crossings, putting in walking and cycling routes uh, and creating people places uh, through, through seating, through planting, um, through community activities. Uh, and, and the bits at the bottom um, uh, will not necessarily be delivered as part of places for people, but there are other things that the council's doing that we'll deliver alongside that. Um, so school streets uh, that we're, we're now delivering with a number of schools across the city uh, where we close the, the streets outside schools to traffic at the start and end of the day. 20 mile per hour speed limits, which is something that we want to roll out across all um, residential streets in the city uh, as soon as we can uh, and developing a, a walking and cycling network across the city. So uh, lots of potential, lots of opportunity. Uh, and what we're really keen to do is, is to work with yourselves, work with local residents, with ward councillors and with others um, to identify how we can create places for people uh, across Birmingham. So um, thank you very much for your time and, and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Joe, for the presentation. Um, the first question that I have is, what is Birmingham City Council's plans on expanding cycle lanes around Birmingham, like the one we have on the Bristol Road, especially along places like the Stratford Road? So I think um, I, I, in terms of what our plans are, our plans are is to um, do, do more of them and do as many as possible. And I think particularly on the, the, that sort of cycle lane is what's needed across the city on the main roads, on the arterial corridors um, coming into the city centre and, and going across the city, including the Stratford Road. Uh, so at the start of this year, we, we did publish um, and, and Cabinet approved a walking and cycling strategy which identifies a, a network plan for where we want to deliver that uh, over the next few sort of years. Obviously, with, with all of these things, it ultimately comes down to funding and, and whether we've got the money that we need to deliver those routes. But the ambition is, is very much there. And that's the sort I think the, the great thing about the blue routes um, on the uh, on the Bristol Road and also on the Warsaw Road uh, is that sort of sets out the, the standard, the quality of what we want to see. And that's what we want to see across Birmingham on, on all main routes uh, as, as soon as we can deliver that really. Um, obviously, every single location is slightly different. Some locations have more space available than others. In, in some places, we may need to look at where that space will be created from. Um, but yeah, definitely the ambition is there for, for more of that as, as soon as possible. Okay, a question from me would be, I have a lot of residents talk to me about being concerned about dangerous cars around schools. Um, what can we do to help the situation to make children and teachers and parents feel safe whilst going to school? Sure, I mean, unfortunately, it is a, a common problem uh, outside schools ac across the city, probably virtually every single school has got some some issues around dangerous driving, speeding, uh, parking, uh, illegal parking. Um, and the, the, the really sad thing about that is part of the impact is it puts off people from walking and cycling because they don't feel it's safe, which means there's more people driving. So you get this sort of like vicious circle. Um, th there's a lot of things that we can do and are trying to do to uh, improve that. Um, part of it comes down to, to working with the police and, and our own parking team around enforcement. So uh, where we are able to have some enforcement activity uh, to tackle the, the, the worst sort of cases of that. Um, although obviously 
uh, everyone's resources are stretched and, and, and the police and others have got lots of uh, other things to be dealing with at the current time so that's, so that's always limited to an extent i think what we're increasingly trying to do is address some of those issues through engineering measures um, so what are the things that we can put in place to, to stop people from being able to um, drive dangerously, park illegally, uh, by putting physical measures in. Um, also, I think working very closely with, with our schools, with local residents, with councillors uh, around education and, and engagement as well. So sort of getting across some of the impacts of that, reminding people um, of some of the risks and dangers that they pose particularly in places where young children are sort of walking to school. Um, I hope that, that there aren't many people out there who would want to deliberately endanger the life of, of young children, but reminding people that when they are driving through these areas, uh, that they are potentially coming into um, those situations. Within the council, we have um, Mode Shift Stars programme, which is free for all schools. So every school in Birmingham can sign up to Mode Shift Stars, get support, access resources and initiatives, um, which looks at road safety, which looks at encouraging walking and cycling um, and, and can develop all sorts of um, activities and initiatives as part of the, uh, the travel plan. So I think if there is anyone that's linked into any schools in the area and they want to get involved and, and want to get support through that, um, that's probably the first step to take. Uh, but it, it is about a combination of all of these different things in terms of enforcement, engineering and engagement. So the next question I have says, does any of the second tranche of funding cover any improvements for Spark Hill Ward? So then what, what we're currently doing with the um, tranche two is finalising exactly where these schemes are going to be delivered. Um, some of the submission did identify particular locations and to be honest, I don't think any of those were in sort of Spark Hill or Hall Green, um, but some of the programmes were around more sort of general interventions. Um, so there is still some sort of scope for putting forward suggestions around where there might be particular uh, issues or, or need for actions. I think the, the other point to sort of make on that is as well as the Emergency Active Travel Fund, uh, we do have a, a Transport and Highways Capital Programme, which includes all sorts of um, funding pots uh, around local safety schemes, uh, ward minor measures, safer routes to school. Uh, and we are also looking to add to that in terms of additional funding for things like safer crossings um, and for 20 mile an hour areas. So I think if, even if there aren't schemes identified at the current time, uh, we, we are looking to find additional for funding um, for this all of the time uh, and, and we are wanting to see a good spread uh, across the city. When we do bring forward schemes such as safer routes to school, uh, we do always sort of monitor that in terms of which wards um, schemes are being delivered in uh, and, and do try to get as good a spread and as good a balance as we can within the available resource. But I think the, the key thing is if people have got particular locations in mind, uh, if, if you know that there are issues in your area on your street and, and you have ideas for what could be done, um, then put those suggestions forward, let you let the councillors know, uh, get in touch with us through Connected, uh, Birmingham Connected or, or online on the Commonplace site because uh, we're always looking for the next sort of a set of schemes to include in future funding bids. The next question I have is more of a comment, but I will ask it as a question. So it says, we can we introduce mechanisms to take photos and send to you, the council, to get traffic wardens out to give tickets? This would raise money for the council. Uh, there are sometimes examples where third party reporting can be used. Um, it tends more to be done by um, West Midlands Police. So for particular traffic offences that, that, that they um, enforce, they have a third party reporting system where people can take photos of people sort of committing dangerous offences. I know that's something they've done with, with Operation Close Pass, where cyclists have used video footage. Um, I'm not sure about the extent to which we've done third party reporting for um, parking infringements. Um, it may be something that we could sort of look at a bit more. Um, part, part of the issue is around um, 
how, how legally robust it is and whether it would stand up to sort of criminal process uh, in terms of the photo evidence uh, and also people who submit that being willing to uh, testify if necessary. Um, unfortunately, if challenged, it can't be done anonymously, um, but there's certainly some sort of potential in that. I think the other thing that we try to do is um, both the council and the police work with residents on things like community speed watch um, and, and getting citizens involved in being present in their area uh, and, and trying to uh, address some of the worst incidents that are happening around speeding, around parking infringements. So yeah, th th there are some examples where third party reporting can be used, um, but it isn't um, possible to use that for, for every uh, incident or infringement. So I have a question three from Councillor Lee Robson. She has said many of the school Hall Green schools are signed up to the mode shift stars and I can see lots of scope in the area for linking the safe schools and some of the local traffic measures. A lot of residents would like 20 mile an hour zones. What is the best way for residents and councillors to work with the track to work with the council's traffic officers to develop ideas? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely a lot of people across Birmingham would like 20 mile per hour limits where they live. Uh, and that was something that, that we're keen to, to do as quickly as possible. Um, we did actually put in a request to central government earlier this year um, for Birmingham to, to be able to be a sort of default 20 mile per hour city. Uh, but unfortunately, that request was, was rejected by, by the government and the Secretary of State. Um, the consequence of that is that although we can deliver 20 mile per hour limits uh, across the city, it takes longer and it costs more. So whereas if we had Department for Transport support for default 20 and, and less requirement around signage and doing it in less of a piecemeal way, we'd be able to do it sooner. Um, but, but we do have a policy of introducing 20 mile per hour on, on all residential streets across Birmingham. Uh, we are looking to roll that out as soon as we can, as, as soon as the funding becomes available. Um, again, a bit like with some of the Mode Shift Stars stuff, I think that's sort of the, the best way and, and with the um, future schemes. Uh, the best way is, is shouting up and, and being really loud about where you want to see that and demanding it um, from your councillors, from the cabinet member, from, from the council um, and making sure that we do that as soon as possible. Ultimately with a lot of these things it comes down to uh, having the funding needed to deliver these schemes um, and, and 20 mile per hour uh, limits do have quite a lot of costs because of the signage involved, because of the traffic regulation orders, um, which is why we are keen to sort of explore some ways of doing that cheaper and sooner. Um, but yeah, I think sort of things like petitions can help as well because it's, it's another way of sort of demonstrating uh, that there's a real strong demand for this from local residents. We, we know that um, people in across Birmingham want to see this. There's always really strong public support for things like 20 mile per hour and, and um, addressing traffic issues in local areas between 70 and 80 percent of people generally supporting that. So anything we can do to demonstrate it, uh, we're, we're keen to, to get that out as, as I say, ultimately comes down to money and the more we've got, the more we can do. So the next question is about the kind of parking that really annoys me as a local councillor um, when people decide to kind of plunk their car half on the street, half on the pavement, wheelchairs, pushchairs can't get through. Is there anything that we can do about that? There is and, and hopefully in sort of fairly near future there'll be a bit more as well. So government have recently carried out a consultation around pavement parking. Um, in London, there's slightly different uh, legislation that means it is an offence for pavement parking, for people to park on the pavement in London. Um, that there has been this consultation on whether that should be extended to uh, other places and Birmingham City Council responded to that uh, and said that we would be keen to have powers to be able to address pavement parking. Um, at the moment, that there are times it can be um, uh, tackled if it is causing an obstruction um, or if it's particularly dangerous, so if it's blocking junctions um, and if it's not possible for people with um, disabilities or with young children to get through, sometimes the police can. Um, but I think often where you see the sort of situation you describe where people are like half on the pavement, half on the road, they actually think that they're being helpful, almost like getting out of the way a little bit of people um, 
driving down those streets and they forget about how much of an obstruction that is for, for people who are maybe trying to get through with a double buggy or uh, in a mobility scooter. So I think we do need to sort of try and get across to people that although they might think that they're um, being responsible by parking half on the pavement, that can really be a block and hopefully with this sort of change in legislation uh, we might have a few more powers to address that. Obviously in, in some parts of the city and particularly where there's a lot of terraced housing and, and places are sort of um, double parked, if we did um, make pavement parking like, almost like illegal everywhere then that's going to really create some issues and challenges for us as to um, where people can park near, near their homes. So I think one of the things we said in the consultation is we would need to look at how that was introduced and, and some streets probably would need to be made exempt from that if there were particular local circumstances um, that, that meant it had to be um, uh, permissible to park on pavement in certain places. But I think generally we would like to see that uh, reduced because of the issues it creates for people getting around. And the last question I'm going to take on this agenda item says, how can we as a community in Spark Hill and Hall Green North contact you to discuss various parking, walking or cycling issues? Sorry, um, so th th there's a number of ways you can get in touch. Um, through, through your ward councillors is one of them and, and, and you're, you're fortunate to have so, uh, some great councillors in, in Hall Green North and Spark Hill who are, who are always raising various issues around uh, transport, traffic, school travel uh, with us. Um, Birmingham Connected is the sort of council department that deals with a lot of um, transport issues. So you can contact us via email connected at birmingham.gov.uk. Um, and, and we do have social media accounts as well on, on Twitter and Facebook, so you can get in touch via those. And um, we do use a um, sort of digital online platform called Commonplace as well. So that's one um, way where people can put forward particular suggestions for um, schemes or, or measures or where you think we could introduce some improvements to make it safer to walk or cycle uh, in the places where you live. OK, I'm going to end that agenda item now and I'm going to thank Joe so much for coming to, to speak to us tonight. It's been really interesting and you've got sure. lots of things to um, discuss in the future and look forward to. So I'm going to move on to our fifth agenda item, which is councillor updates. And I am going to go. Oh, first of all, I'm going to say happy Christmas as well, Joe, if I don't see you before and have a lovely happy new year too. Cheers. Then we'll move, move on to councillor updates. And I'm going to let Councillor Lou Robson do her update for Hall Green North first. You're live now. Thank you. It's it's always it's always fun negotiating the technology, and um, I'm sorry if I've got a very official backdrop. Um, but I, that's that's from a meeting I chaired yesterday and I can't seem to get it off my computer. Um, so you're not going to see my my um, my living room tonight. Um, well, thanks everybody. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, and I think it's really good that we have these joint joint meetings uh, because there are a lot of issues that are in common across the wards. I think our last meeting was actually several months ago. Um, uh, tonight, um, I've got to send apologies from um, Councillor Akak Ahmed, who's who's not well and couldn't make it. Um, and just uh, just some um, rec recent issues. Um, I think, in a way, um, you know, over over the last nine months. Um, you know, a lot of the issues have been focused around around um, around COVID and people trying to get help in in various ways. Um, thankfully, I think so many organisations have have stepped up. You know, some magnificent people, particularly um, in our area, the mosques, the churches, um, the voluntary the voluntary the voluntary groups. 
um, places like Highfield Hall, the Church of Ascension and, and the, the Oak. Um, they've been magnificent. Um, one of one of the things uh, a lot of people um, over the summer, there were so many um, awful lot of um, um, illegal building that uh, people were raising with me. That seems to have calmed down, perhaps um, perhaps because more people are going are going back to work. Um, I know I know not everyone is back at work and there are a lot of people in our area who are being put out of work. Um, and um, have been, have been, have been trying to find uh, trying to find new jobs. Uh, so it has been difficult for a lot of people. I think a lot of things have settled down. You know, people are going back to school. Although you know, we we do often hear of instances where whole school bubbles are, are sent home. Um, but just a sort of recent highlights. Um, one thing that's come through today. Um, and I know there are different opinions um, among residents on this, but there was a planning application in to demolish the horseshoe pub on on the Stratford Road, which um, you know at the corner, uh, the crossroads opposite the um, South and City College. Um, there was a plan to put a supermarket and a Costa Coffee drive-in there, uh, which some people welcomed, um, but a lot of people felt very strongly. Um, about demolishing um, an old building um, and a quite a historic landmark. Uh, that's been, we just had the news today that that application has been refused um, by, by planning officers. Um, so I can't say, I can't say what will happen next. Sometimes with these things, the new owner, the developer may go back and sort of have discussions and find out what would be acceptable in planning terms. Um, but you know, it'd be good to hear what people would like to um, would like to see on that site. I mean, it's a big space. My personally, I'd love to see a market, and I'd love to see the building kept um, and perhaps used for sort of indoor and outdoor market stalls. You know, that's something we could you know really do with, and and would bring a lot of life back to the area. Um, other things, um, just picking up on on what um, what Joe Green wa was presenting, um, you know, very gradual, as he said, you know, everything costs money, but we are managing to introduce some traffic measures um, and those are particularly by the Hall Green Infant School. One of the things about the Mode Shift, Star Mode Shift Stars programme that Joe mentioned is that once the school signs up to it, that actually unlocks money um, that, that the council can use to put in road measures. So we're doing that with some protective measures around Staplehurst, Petersfield and Stratford Road around the um, infant and junior school. Uh, we've also had um, enforcement officers out there. Obviously, they can't be there 24 hours a day, but um, you know, been, I, I constantly lobby to have them around schools. Um, and 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 that has been happening. Um, in in the new year, uh, we will have hopefully another meeting uh, with a bit more of an update on some of the planned improvements that'll be happening along the whole green stretch of the Stratford Road. That will be from the College Arms to Robin Hood Island. Um, there were um, plans just to sort of make some areas more more green um uh safer um but but um i think we'll, we'll wait till the new year obviously look out for the invitation and i think we'll have doug lee um uh to to come and uh, talk a bit more about that um i'm happy uh just another thing that's coming up this coming up this weekend um we're people are, are now allowed to do um obviously socially distanced but to be able to have some community cleanup events. Um, and I don't, don't know if people know, but one of the main cleanup groups in our area is the Sarehole Environmental Action Team. And they, they're usually out uh, at least once a month, often more, doing cleanups and planting, mainly around the River Cole. So this, this, this Saturday from 9 a.m., um, they'll be at um, by um, 
by Sarehole Mill, so I think meet it meet in the car park, and they're clearing up an area which is known as the Withy Windle, and ultimately they want to restore that to an outdoor amphitheatre, which it always was, but it's become very overgrown. So if anybody fancies braving the weather, um, very welcome to join people. There's some information about that on my Facebook page, which is Councillor Lou Robson. Um, and I'm told that there will be mince pies. So uh, that's an incentive. I'm very happy to take any uh, questions on any issues um, in the in the ward. I have what had one submitted in writing, but I'll take uh, I'll take um, any any from those who are who are waiting to speak here. Don't have any questions yet. Just waiting to see if any questions come through. We don't have any yet. Do you want to talk about your written question, Councillor Robson? Thanks, Councillor Brennan. Um, the written question um, came um, from um, someone in Hall Green North who lives close to um, Stratford Road um, and they have asked, is it possible to talk about the litter and pavements not swept? It's so difficult to walk, especially for our senior citizens. It's dangerous and an eyesore and we're waiting for an accident. Residents have been doing their bit. Um, but we don't know when did the council last clean the pavements and the roads. Uh, there aren't enough street bins and the few which are there are full and haven't been emptied. The roads I would like to highlight are Fox Hollies School Road, Stratford Road between Hamlet Road and Industry Road. And as soon as it gets colder, it's going to be worse. So thank you for um, thank you for putting that, that that question in. I mean, this this is a perpetual problem, um, not just in Hall Green North, but through but throughout Birmingham. Um, I, I mean, ultimately, it comes down to people who drop litter. Um, the council does do regular. Uh, it depends on how how busy the road is. Um, you know how frequently it's used. Um, but all roads are swept at least monthly. Some are swept weekly or fortnightly. Um, and I know people often say, well, we never see the sweep sweepers, but uh, they are about. Um, we also obviously have people, including myself, who regularly report incidents of, of fly tipping. I wish that didn't happen. Um, I, I just think it's you know it, it's the biggest disrespect for your in you know for your environment um we've got some wonderful people who do go out cleaning it up and reporting it um again i work to try and get some of the worst worst hot spots done problem is often that they're on private land um if it's council land that's a lot simpler if it's on private land the council can only come in and clean it or make the owner clean it if it's an environmental health hazard. Um, and again, um, you know, but, but it, it's it's about reporting. So I think if, if if we can all do that and if we can all, you know, do our best to, um, you know, give a good example. Um, the issue about street that, oh, just, um, there has been extra cleaning, obviously, because we're in, we're in leaf season and um, what, what's been happening with that? Um, all roads should be swept. Again, some will be more frequent and, and some they will get to first. Uh, and they've started with roads, obviously around River Coal, anywhere there is more likely to be um, a flood risk if the drains get blocked by fallen leaves. Um, residents, uh, quite a lot of residents often do their own leaf picking this time of year and it's possible to ring the council and ask for bags to be delivered and those will be, and, and again, make an arrangement for those to be picked up by the bin men. 
Um, the, the, I've had quite a few complaints about street bins being removed. Um, and I, I did ask very firmly for no more bins to be taken out of Hall Green. What has been happening, and I think the, the, some of them have been along Stratford Road, and there's one also um, outside the shops, um, just on our side of the Robin Hood Island. What's happening is people have just been using those to fly tip and dump rubbish, um, so they've ended up taking ended up taking them them away. Um, I don't I don't personally think that's the answer. Um, but but that's the answer I've got from I've got from the waste department. I've got questions for you. OK. Um, the question I'm seeing is. What what do you think? So the, the questions I have for you, oh. are, I'll give you both of them. Oh, you tell me them then. It's uh, the first question is, what do you think of the Hall Green Parade Shopping Centre? And the second question is, can any action be taken to get the car park by pound stretcher cleaned up? So that's the two questions I have. OK, well, they're on opposite sides of the Stratford Road, so um, we'll, I will take them like that. Um, what do I think of Hall Green Shopping Parade? Um, I think there's an awful lot of room for improvement and that view is is shared by a lot of people who live in Hall Green who have seen it change very much over the past 20 years. Um, it's not again, it's not something that is unique to it, it is unique to Hall Green. Um, and I think there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of reasons people going to sort of out of town retail parks, driving to the supermarket instead of going to you know the butcher the baker um and everything there are some there are some lovely shops along there who really are trying to um you know bring bring life back into the area i know they've changed i mean some of this has been because you know the businesses were owned by older people as they've retired you know perhaps they haven't been able to continue the business um and it, and it can be a really vicious circle because you know, the fewer the shops, the fewer the people go there, the reasons change. And there has been an explosion um, of, um, of um, fast food places, whether that's takeaway or restaurants. Now, a lot of them are, are, are lovely to go to for food, um, but I think it actually brings problems of rubbish. It brings problems of parking um and yeah it's something that you know we're constantly trying to work on with with the businesses there is a whole green in business group uh which we're trying to you know trying to get people to join um and generally get people to take a lot more pride in the area i mean i i would actually say if possible um if it's a christmas or if it's a birthday or another festival if possible it's great if people can do their shopping locally um, and, and support those businesses, um, whether that's businesses on, on the parade or um, just local businesses that, that often advertise online. To come to the question about the pound stretcher um, car park, a lot of people ask about this, um, particularly people who live on Greenbank Avenue. Again, this is private land. Um, so the answer is the unless it's an environmental health hazard, um, it's very difficult for for the council for the council to take this up. Um, people have tried asking the pound stretcher shop, but they've just um, they they don't um, they don't feel they take any responsibility for it. Um, without knowing who the actual owner is, it's quite hard to um, put that pressure on. But that's something I can ask council officers to track down and do some work on. Another question. So we have another question and it's for either councillor and it says, our household bins and can our household bins and recycling bins be painted, decorated or graffitied? Or do they have to stay 
the way they are as they are provided by the council. That's not a question I'm 100% sure on. My recycling and my household bin do have some lovely sunflower stickers with my house number on because our bins always get muddled and it saved arguments with the neighbours about missing bins. So I'm just, I, I'm not 100% sure, I, I can get it checked. I am just going to pass over to Councillor Lou Robson to see if she knows the answer. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I can't shed any more light on this um, than, than, than uh, Councillor Brennan can. Yes, I have my, I have my, um, I have some numbers on my, bin, on, uh, on my bins. Hasn't always stopped them getting uh, stolen or disappearing. Um, but in, in my street, um, actually, people do. De I have seen people decorate their bins. I think you can buy, um, you know, you can buy on stick on plastic with, you know, grass, flowers, beach scenes. I mean, some people, some people in my street have. Um, have political slogans on theirs and um, du during during the pandemic pe people were putting stickers on them saying you know um, you know clap for the NHS and, and thanking thanking the bin workers for, for, for keeping working um, and some people actually also just uh, put 20 mile an hour stickers on them so uh, to give pe people a bit of a reminder um, so I think that's something we'll 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 check out, but I uh, I don't think it's. I mean I can't don't don't quote me, but I can't see the problem. And um, you know, if people want to make their bins look beautiful. Fine by me. We could even have a competition. It sounds lovely. <laughs> yeah, we will get it checked out, and we will get the answers to you. So I will now provide my um, update and I'm happy to have any questions come into the box, which I'm sure they will as I go along. My first update is about Spark Hill Flood Action Group, um, which mainly is around Percy Road and Foreman's Road and the surrounding roads. And it is resident led with support from businesses and I also support too. And um, what has happened recently is we haven't been able to meet since February uh, because of COVID but I will be helping and supporting to set up another meeting in the new year so that residents can ask the City Council, the Environment Agency, um, Seven Trent Water, I think Western Power come as well so so we have kind of Fleet and Waste there, Kia come, um, drainage team come, resilience come to, to kind of be held account by the residents, answer their questions and come up with solutions. So one of the successes that we've had is we've had a camera put on on the Foreman's Road junction in the river so residents can log in, they can check the, the, the water levels and put their minds at rest and the Environment Agency will have a clear view of how high or low the river is. Um, we were being supported by the Communities Prepared team, but the person that was in charge of the team has uh, left and got another job, so we're just waiting for them to recruit another one. We've now set up an email address, which is Spark Hill Flag, um, so people can get in touch if they'd like to come to meetings or they've got any suggestions. And next week we will be doing a letter drop on the roads affected. Uh, the letter will be in four different languages. Um, and it will also have a fridge magnet with it so people can put it on their fridge and it will have all the emergency numbers because I know when the flooding happened in May, people were quite didn't know who to call um, and who to get in touch with. So this will have all of the um all of the numbers that are needed. I've also had a update from the Pentos Drive business um, bid and they say they have told me to tell you that Pentos Drive will be carrying out several activities to make the junction with Foreman's Road safer. They want to put parking restrictions at the junction and an independent parking company will manage the activity. Signage is going to be installed and a letter will be issued to the local businesses and residents 
notifying them of the changes that will be taking place and they are looking to put gates on to the Pentos Drive which will stop the antisocial behaviour that's going on there. Um, oh, oh the, the only thing that's come through is somebody saying that <laughs> saying that they want to give their bin a full makeover which sounds lovely and I will say as well um, Councillor Robson has reminded me that um, that residents in Hall Green North are also welcome to come to the Spark Hill um, flood action meeting as well. Um, I'm just going to see if I can pass over to her slightly just so she can give an update about that, about the affected roads, because she will know more than I do. Thank you. Um, yes, we um, anybody, anybody um, can be put in touch uh, with the Spark Hill flag group. Um, and go on their mailing list. And I've I've really encouraged people, obviously you live along the River Cole, so that's um, Sarehole Road, Alf Foreman's Road, Runnymede Road, and, and so on. And the, the basically any anywhere in in that sort of uh, around the, the sort of start of um, Stratford Road in, in our ward. Um, and and quite a few people from 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 Sarehole Road have been interested. Um, and again, you know, this is something that uh, raises its raises itself whenever there are whenever there are floods. Uh, we have particular problems around Green Road Ford, which everyone seems to like to uh, drive through when the, when the waters raise. But it just helped, um, you know, all the way down to Sarehole Mill. Um, they've got some sandbags. Just being part of the flood action group can really help, um, really help with th with that sort of immediate response when there is flooding. And and, and as Councillor Brennan said, you know, it's a chance to meet up with some of with the street cleaning people, um, with the, with the water management, um, and 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 put those concerns. I do know as 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 well as the work that's being done up at the. Um, the Foreman's Road end. Um, there is regular regular channel clearing um, and 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 um, clearing out rubbish and vegetation um, further. I can never remember if it's downstream or upstream, um, but both both sides of the bridge along Stratford Road. Um, and again, that's just another plug to come to the environmental clean up day on Saturday because what they do is a really important part of keeping the area flood safe. Thank you. Something else that I've been doing is I meet up for um, a walk around like an all day uh, with the local police. It normally contains of me having a couple of hours chat with them about things that they're up to um, in the ward. Um, what successes they've had, what problems they're having. Um, and one of the PCSOs and me have been going out to local schools, making sure people are parking properly, moving them on, talking to the head teacher, talking to the children that are there. Um, the latest one that we went to was Greet School, which we found that local residents were, were feeling unsafe because it's terrace houses to the, to the road. So it's, you walk out to your house onto the road cars were kind of driving up on the one side of Percy Road and people were feeling very unsafe so we went up with the local PCSO to make sure drivers were behaving sensibly and it is it's quite funny what a flecker jacket can do everybody started parking properly nobody was parking on zigzag lines everyone was a lot more calmer and polite um, but I have asked traffic enforcement to also go up to the schools and make sure they're ticketing people that are being dangerous and putting our children in danger. Next week, I will be going out with the local police again to Lines Grove, which has been having issues with where cars are parking. So we're going to go out and speak to the residents there about what they think they'd like that would make it easier for them. Um, because I don't think it's fair that measures would be put in place without actually talking to the local residents that live there. Um, 
I did have something else as well. Oh, we have traffic. We're going to be having bollards as well put onto Foreman's Road to stop the bad parking. So we'll go up to Foreman's Road, Hollyhill Road, Knoll Road, and back down. If anybody has any questions for me, there's, lot, there's lots of things in my brain that I've done, <laughs> but if anybody has any specific questions for me, please type them in the box and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, I've also carried on chairing our domestic abuse board for the city um, and just to reassure people that services are still open in the lockdown. There has been an increase in need, but there are services there. Women's Aid, um, Trident, there is um, a link on the City Council's website with all the helpline numbers, but I will publish it on my social media after the meeting. I'll give it, oh, we had a new question. Well done. No. Not had any more questions. Um, I know we have as well that we've had a police update, but we're still having issues with the technology about trying to get the police to come into the meetings. So we're not unable to give a proper police update, but it is something that I will work on for the new year. Um, I am looking at having another Spark Hill board forum online in the new year, probably at the end of January. Um, I, will, we will, we, I will speak to my neighbouring colleagues in Hall Green North to see if, that, if they would like to continue doing joint forums. I'm just going to pass it back over to Councillor Robson to see if she has anything else that she'd like to add to the meeting. Um, just to thank everybody for taking the time um, to come tonight. Uh, we, we had some, um, you know, really good speakers. I mean, Justin Varney and, and Joe Green um, it, it's great to see that we've got such good officers at the council who, you know, really, really make the effort to um, come and talk to residents and, and make sure that that information is getting out to people. Um, and I know that they both work incredibly hard, so uh, it was good to see them. So for the moment, again, well, I'd, I'd certainly be happy to continue um, d d um, do it, doing uh, doing the joint forums. I think it works quite well. And um, yeah, all for now is just I hope um, that everyone has a good break um, over the you know at the end of the month. And um, we, we've all been missing our families, I think, um, and our friends. Um, and but just you know. As, as Justin said, stay happy and stay safe and best wishes to everybody. What I will say, and I forgot to mention, is there is a lot of residents coming towards me, and I don't probably to Councillor Robson as well, about HMOs. Other constituencies in Birmingham have had little mini conferences um, with the private rental sector and the cabinet member and Hall Green constituency will be having one of these meetings in the new year and we will make sure anybody that's come to this meeting or is interested will get invited. Um, I'll make sure the local police as well know about it. Um, I'm just trying to find the details of it now and it will take me one second to do so. Um, but I have updated my mobile number. Um, so if anybody would like to contact me by mobile phone, you can text me, you can WhatsApp me, you can email me, you can ring me as long as it's not two o'clock in the morning. Um, my new number is 075481222203. And I'll repeat that again. It is 075481 22203. Um, being as we haven't got any more questions in the boxes, I'm going to end the meeting now. And I'd just like to wish that everybody has a happy Christmas if you're celebrating, a lovely break, and a happy new year. And I hope you all stay safe and healthy. So thank you for everybody for attending. It's been really lovely. And I look forward to the next meeting in the new year.